This is lecture 10, and we finally landed at my favorite lecture, the lecture on love and relationships, on attraction and relationships. And um, because I am an expert on this topic, I'll be adding quite some information to the book. I also think the book is actually not done a terrific job when it comes to this chapter because I think so quite some vital information is missing. Also, I have some problems with some of the experiments that are in the book, and I'll tell you all about that uh, during uh, this uh, lecture. So um, what, where I want to start is not where the book starts. The book starts at attraction, and of course we're going to talk about attraction and, and why we feel attraction towards certain people and not towards others. Very interesting topic, but I want to start at the very basic uh, namely the question, why, do, why should we care about love? What is the importance of relationships in our lives? Why am I so passionate about, about this topic? And why should you care also uh, about this topic? So the science of love and attraction is actually very new. It's a young science. And studying love was actually not done for a very long time. Um, it was not taken seriously. It was sort of a soft science, something that you couldn't you know, uh, study under a microscope or, and, and, and for a lot of people uh, and a lot of scientists for a long time uh, didn't really care for this, for this very in interesting and important topic. Uh, this started to change uh, around 1958 uh, with experiments done not on humans, but on animals, uh, specifically on baby monkeys, infant monkeys. You see it over here. Harry Harlow did some experiments on these monkeys, and these uh, experiments became very famous. And it was basically the starting phase of studying uh, love uh, scientifically. Um, and uh, what Harry Harlow did in his experiments, and I'll show you a, a short video clip where you see uh, uh, Harlow talking about uh, this experiments with the baby monkeys, was he separated the young infant monkeys from their mothers. And he started to study their behavior. And very soon he realized that if you separate babies, in this case baby monkeys, from their mothers, they become, they, they get very panicky. And they should because they are helpless without their mothers. They need uh, their care t caretakers to, to be around them, to support them, to nourish them. And also, and this is crucial in the experiment of Harlow, to provide comfort. And what Harry Harlow showed was that he created surrogate mothers for the infant monkeys. And sometimes these surrogate mothers provided food which arguably would be very important for the baby monkeys, right? They needed to, needed to, uh, to uh, have food, specifically uh, drink milk from bottles. And he created a wire mother, that you also see in the screen here, that provided milk, so provided food. And then he also provided a surrogate mother that did not provide uh, any uh, milk, no, and not any food items, but that had like this very soft, warm appearance sort of uh, simulating what uh, the mother of the monkey would look like. And uh, what Harry, Harry Harlow showed in these experiments was that actually providing comfort was even more important for the baby monkeys than uh, providing food. And I'll now show you a brief uh, video fragment of the experiments of uh, Harry Harlow. I do want to warn you, though, uh, that these experiments, um, they do provide some images of animal cruelty. Even though I think the intentions of Harry Harlow were good, he wanted to study if love mattered, and uh, as I just mentioned, the science of love was non-existent. Nobody knew that providing comfort and uh, being around and being uh, an attachment figure would be so important for babies. It makes so much sense, of course, to all of us, and intuitively, it just you know it's just right. But at that moment in time, people didn't really know. They thought as long as there's food, as there's shelter place to sleep, then we'll be fine. And Harry Harlow changed all that with his experiments on these infant monkeys. But I want to warn you before I show the video fragments that you might be a bit shocked uh, to see these baby monkeys in distress, uh, separated from uh, their mothers. Uh, so just keep this in mind. Also keep in mind that these experiments uh, can, could, will and, and can never be uh, done again scientifically because they just break a lot of ethics rules um, sometimes, and actually some of the experiments done around this time would now uh, break the law. And there were actually also experiments done on human uh, infants, uh, young children. I won't show these footage because that's just way too shocking. But just keep in mind that that would never happen again. And even though it's horrible that these experiments were conducted, they did give a lot of insight 
into our human needs, uh, need for, for love and, and relationships. So uh, please uh, take a moment to um, look at the footage of Harry Harlow and his baby monkeys. Let me show you a monkey raised on a nursing wire mother. Now here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. He's got to eat to live. Going back. He's back on the cloth mother and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother? Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use. That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sound, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now, here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. He's scared, all right, and he does what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical object. All right. This gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantile love. This is a six-foot square room with a few toys and other objects. But to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are often overwhelmed with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkeys. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. Notice how cautiously he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out 
and put in a wire mother. Now, this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right. All his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Now, we'll try the same test with a cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Despite the fact that the wire mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, as if he were seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir of affection and security. First his body relaxes as the fear disappears. But above and beyond this, new positive response patterns appear. He now goes out to explore and investigate this new strange world. He is now a normal, happy, curious baby. So as you can see uh, in, in, in this video fragments, uh, these experiments uh, were done to show that comfort is at least as important as providing food. And later on, there were more experiments conducted in which these baby monkeys grew up without any surrogate mother at all. So no cloth mother would be provided. And what Harry Harlow then showed was even more disturbing. He showed that uh, these baby monkeys growing up without a cloth mother really became out of control. They started showing very inappropriate behavior, also inappropriate sexual behavior, became very aggressive, and they never really uh, be become, became socialized. Even later on, when he tried to place these monkeys in groups, that was not possible anymore. These monkeys were just uh, lost, basically. They couldn't uh, grow into to normally functioning uh, monkeys, and they also died at a very young age, also from stress, probably. And this is something that even though these experiments are luckily never done again, uh, we still see this type of disturbing behaviors. For example, in elephants, uh, and the poaching of, of elephants is, of course, a big problem, especially in parts of Africa. Uh, mothers of, of baby, uh, baby elephants are poached for the ivory. And uh, there you also see the same thing happening, that these baby elephants, they have to grow up without the comfort of a mother. And they also grow up into socially very inappropriate uh, elephants. And they, they can, cannot uh, uh, f find a way into a group of elephants. And they also basically are lost, lost causes. So the moment a mother elephant is poached, the baby elephant is actually also dead. And that's why there's uh, l luckily a lot of orphanages for, for baby elephants. So this is just for you to, to, to show and, and, and understand how crucial it is for us humans and uh, for, for monkeys and for all animals, basically, to uh, have uh, people to look after you. And I also already mentioned, so this is the case for, for humans just as much, of course, as for animals. And also not only in infants and young children, but also when we get older, this, this human need for social contact, we really, we, we crave it, we need it. We need to form connections to others. And if we don't have it, then you know, we just get very upset and, and distressed, and it's very bad for our uh, overall well-being, uh, mentally as well as physically. And this is actually very nicely illustrated in a movie. Uh, maybe you know the movie. It's quite old already. Uh, it's called Castaway, and um, the, uh, the main character is uh, Chuck Nolan, uh, played by Tom Hanks. And in this movie, if you haven't watched it yet, I definitely would recommend it. What you see there is that the main character, Chuck, is stranded at, at a deserted island. And um, he is stranded there because a plane crashed, and in the plane there was also some materials, uh, and one of those materials was a volleyball, a volleyball of the brand Wilson. And the moment Chuck lands on the deserted island, uh, first, of course, he tries, he tries to you know, find some food and, and get some shelter, but at a certain moment, quite quickly, actually, he gets bored, and he starts wandering around the island, and he finds Wilson, the volleyball. 
And he picks it up, and his hand is a bit bloody because, you know, he hurt himself. And he creates, with the blood on his hands, he, he makes sort of a figure on the ball. And he creates a little face on the ball. And it just looks a bit silly in the beginning. But what happens then in the movie, and I won't, you know, spoil everything if you still want to watch it, but what you see there is that... Chuck actually starts creating a bond with the volleyball, and he, he names the volleyball Wilson, after the brand, of course. And um, he starts to have conversations with Wilson. At this moment, here in the middle of the screen, you see that he's actually mad at Wilson. He's talking to him, he's discussing uh, ways to, ex uh, to escape from the island with Wilson. And um, what I really like about this movie is that it actually quite you know, uh, correctly um, portrays what happens to human beings if we are cut off from social contact. We need social contact. That's just the way we are wired. We are group animals. We cannot live solitary. We need to have contact with other human beings. And if we don't have it, we need to make sure that we find a way to stay sane. And that's what Chuck did here. He created a friend, and that was his way of keeping sanity. So this human uh, need for contact is actually captured in the theory, and this theory is called the need to belong theory. And this need to belong theory basically just means that humans have a deep uh, need, a thorough need for contact with other humans. We need to have contact in the form of loving relationships. And this need is actually really high up the hierarchy of human needs, right after physical needs like food and drinking and sleep, and also the need for security, of course, right after all that, all these basic needs, we have this need to belong, the need to connect to others. And this is developed by uh, two uh, social psychologists, uh, Baumeister and Leary. And according to this need to belong theory, uh, there are um, actually basically a few conditions um, that need to be fulfilled uh, to have this, this, this need to belong uh, covered. And uh, these conditions are that you have to have regular contact with a person, you're not constantly fighting with each other, uh, and you also have the intention to continue this contact for the long run. So you need to be close to each other. And also, you, and that's maybe the most crucial aspect uh, of this need to belong theory, is that you have to feel that both of you really genuinely care for each other. You really care about each other's well-being and you want to care for each other as well. So um, there's uh, basically three assumptions of this need to belong theory. First of all, it has an evolutionary basis. I already mentioned humans are group animals. You know, we need to, we, we just, we need others to survive. That's also how we are wired. We are wired to connect to others. That's why we have such good communication skills, the ability for language. Um, and we are so preoccupied by forming social contexts. Contacts. Um, it's also, of course, why social psychology uh, first was developed. It's basically because we are social animals. So it's an evolutionary basis. It also means that it's universal. Across the world, we all have this need. It's not something specific for people in, in, different, in, in specific cultures or subsets of the world. So even if you live in an individualistic country like the Netherlands or like the United States, we still need others. We might consider ourselves very independent, but we still rely on others for our uh, general health and well-being. And then finally, the third assumption is that there are serious negative consequences when this need to belong is not fulfilled. And there's actually plenty of evidence for this last assumption. So um, I will uh, show you some evidence in just a moment. But first, before I do so, I want you to imagine what happens if you are cut off from social contacts with others. How do you think you would feel? You probably would feel pretty bad, right? Being all by yourself or being ignored by everyone. So we basically all have this intuition that this doesn't feel good. And uh, that's also maybe why people in relationship, uh, relationships tend to use the silent treatment as a way to punish their partner. Actually, two out of three people use this sometimes. So if you are annoyed by your partner or mad at your partner, you don't get mad, you don't raise your voice. No, you just talk to the hand, you know, I'm, I'm not here, I'm ignoring you. And it's actually a very powerful way of punishing each other because it feels really bad if you are ignored by others, especially if you are ignored by people that you care about. Um, so being a cut off from social context is basically a way we, we, we punish each other socially in our, in our 
own little worlds. Also, of course, children that are naughty are placed on a naughty chair or in the hallway uh, as a way of, of showing them that they are misbehaving and they cannot enter the room anymore. Um, I am always, with my children, very careful by doing so. The moment I use you know, exclusion, I sometimes use it very mildly to exclude them from the conversation if they're being really naughty, but I always make sure that they still see me and that I still respond to them because I just know how hurtful it is, especially for young children to experience this. So I never place them in their rooms by themselves. That's just way too upsetting. Um, so um, using these techniques in social interactions shows us that we know the effect and how painful it is. And as, of course, excluding people is also the society's way of punishing people. For example, in prisons. And especially in some parts of the world, like the United States, uh, some prisoners, the most severe prisoners, like murderers, are stuck in solitary confinement. That means that they are isolated from everyone. They never see other inmates. They actually also don't see any other guards. And a study, there's been studies conducted on these uh, prisoners that live in solitary confinement, basically shows that it leads to enormous emotional damage, uh, so, such as depression, uh, also severe forms of psychos uh, psychosis and paranoia. And a lot of inmates actually start hallucinating to simulate human contact in a way. So basically what Chuck Nolan did on the island, creating a friend, that's what the, these inmates are doing with their brains. So their brain starts imagining other people there as a way to remain sane. And of course, it's already you know, going very far if you start hallucinating that other people are there to have some form of social contact. So this is also not helping. It's definitely not helping to, to uh, get these prisoners back into society. It's really only hurting. Uh, but it is very efficient in punishment, uh, excluding uh, other people. So this is actually also one of the answers to the questions that I raised in the very first lecture, remember? I asked you, so why does it feel so bad to be excluded? And that sometimes we all have had these exper experiences in our lives where we were excluded, ignored by our friends, ghosted on, on social media, uh, maybe your parents used exclusion or putting you in the hallway as you, when you were a young kid. And we remember this, this stuck with us, just because we have this, this very deep need to connect to others. Um, so you don't actually need to live in solitary confinement to experience what it means to be alone. And a lot of people uh, uh, feel alone on, at a daily level, even if they're not alone, even if they're surrounded by other people, but they experience loneliness. And um, loneliness is basically this, this experience that you feel like your need to belong is not fulfilled. Even though there's others around you, you don't feel like these people deeply care about you, maybe not in the same way, way as you care about them. You feel like maybe the contact is not on a regular basis. So the, basically the, 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 the different um, aspects of the need to belong are not fulfilled. And if this happens, this is actually very bad for your health. And, and you, of course, you feel sad a lot. Uh, it's also definitely a risk factor for more serious uh, psychological illnesses, such as depression. Also, people are more likely to become addicted. And in quite a recent study, I think a very cool study, on cardiovascular diseases, it has been shown that the lack of human contact, experiencing loneliness, is actually a bigger risk factor for cardiovascular diseases than smoking. And of course, we all know how bad smoking is for our health, right? So, but in a way, it's better to smoke than to feel lonely if it comes to your, to your health. So um, cardiovascular diseases, and also very simply, it's a predictor of dying young. So if you feel lonely, and I don't mean that you feel lonely at a random day, but like you chronically feel lonely for prolonged period, periods of time, then this is just generally a very serious sign that uh, you're not doing so well. And um, I am very happy that this is now being addressed more and more. And especially, of course, uh, during uh, a pandemic, uh, a lot of people suffered from uh, loneliness and, uh, and it became also uh, something that was in the news uh, more and more. Uh, also at Tilburg University, this has been studied, uh, high levels of stress and loneliness among students. Uh, actually, uh, about 80% of students experienced loneliness in uh, the pandemic. 
And um, this is something that we have to take very seriously. Um, and uh, I now also, because I realize that this might also be upsetting for some students to hear, maybe you are yourself experiencing loneliness, maybe you are yourself experience the effects already of loneliness, feeling uh, more higher levels of depression, or maybe feeling coping with, uh, with uh, addictions more. Uh, I want to end by showing you a brief movie clip, actually, uh, in which you see a conversation be between a student psychologist and a researcher at Tilburg University. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. Gerin Lodder. She studies loneliness, especially among uh, young people, students, and uh, adolescents. And I just want to show you this conversation for support. It's not a part, like a mandatory part for your exam. It's just for those of you that are coping with, uh, with feelings of loneliness or if you're just interested in a topic, then you can watch it out, uh, watch it and also uh, get some advice on, on how to deal with this. So um, I hope you benefit. Uh, eenzaamheid is niet één ding. Hè? Dus het is niet dat iedereen hetzelfde mist als hij zegt ik ben eenzaam. Een belangrijk uh, advies, denk ik, voor studenten die zich eenzaam voelen is praat erover. Ja. Heel veel mensen denken dat uh, eenzaamheid voor jongeren niet echt een issue is. Want zeker voor studenten, van, die zijn toch op de universiteit en dan ben je de hele dag onder de mensen. En iedereen is bij studentenclubs, dus daar speelt dat toch niet echt. Maar um, dan haal je eigenlijk alleen zijn en eenzaam zijn door elkaar. Want eenzaamheid gaat echt om ja, een subjectieve ervaring. En dat kan ook bijvoorbeeld zitten in het missen van kwaliteit van contact. Hè. Dus ik heb wel iemand... Uh, maar ik kan er niet echt bij terecht om uh, mijn problemen te vertellen bijvoorbeeld. Of ik heb niet echt dat diepgaande contact wat ik uh, wel zoek. Uh, en dat, die vorm, dat zien we bij studenten en bij jongeren ook heel veel terug. En, uh, het is echt een misverstand dat dat iets is van ouderen of dat dat onder jongeren uh, niet zou spelen of minder zou spelen. Nou, wij spreken als studentenpsycholoog natuurlijk eh, voornamelijk studenten die ergens mee eh, worstelen, ergens in vastlopen. Dus ja, wij spreken ook studenten die eh, ja, te maken hebben met eenzaamheid. Um, en wat mij ook opvalt, want, hè, want je noemde, uh, ze zijn toch toegerust met vaardigheden, uh, de omstandigheden zijn gunstig, maar ze staan ook voor veel uitdagingen, ja. is wat, uh, wat wij zien. Hè, uh, met name als ze nieuw zijn in de stad, dan hebben ze te maken met een nieuwe omgeving, missen ze hun vertrouwde uh, netwerk voor steun. En uh, ze krijgen er ook een hoop uh, verantwoordelijkheden bij, want behalve studeren, sociale contacten en eventueel werk, moeten zij ook ineens hun dagen zelf structureren. Um, en bijvoorbeeld huishoudelijke taken komen er ook bij. En dat, ja, dus er komt echt wel meer bij kijken dan je denkt. Ja, dat zien we ook zeker in onderzoek terug inderdaad, dat juist die overgangsperiodes ook periodes kunnen zijn waarin dingen als eenzaamheid getriggerd worden. En niet per se dat dat voor iedereen problematisch is, want soms is dat ook wel van voorbijgaande aard, maar wel dat dat echt toeneemt dan. En die jonge volwassenheid is natuurlijk ook een tijd waarin je helemaal je identiteit gaat vormen en waarin je door contact met anderen ja, erachter komt wie je bent eigenlijk. Hè? Ja. Um, dus die sociale relaties zijn super belangrijk en als daar dan iets misgaat, ja, dan kan dat ook best wel impact hebben ja. uh, op, op het leven van jongeren. Ja. We hebben ook onderzoek gedaan uh, in het algemeen naar wat werkte tegen eenzaamheid, maar ook in corona wat er, wat er daar uh, nuttig was. Uh, en wat daarbij heel belangrijk is om te beseffen is dat uh, uh, eenzaamheid is niet één ding. Hè? Dus het is niet dat iedereen hetzelfde mist als hij zegt ik ben eenzaam. En de een zoekt misschien een romantische relatie of mist dat heel erg. De ander uh, uh, heeft echt een groepje nodig om dingen mee te doen of het gevoel van ik hoor erbij hier. En de ander zoekt meer een intiemere vriendschap. Um, dus wat je mist uh, verschilt van persoon tot persoon. En waar dat door komt of wat de problemen zijn die het in stand houden verschilt ook weer van persoon tot persoon. Dus er is niet één oplossing. En dat betekent dat het heel goed is en heel veel is om na te denken over van hé hey, maar hoe lang speelt dit nou eigenlijk? En wat zijn nou de dingen die mij daarin tegenhouden? En om op basis daarvan te kijken van hé hey, kan ik daar wat mee?
Uh, en we zagen tijdens corona ook dat mensen die meer verschillende dingen probeerden, dus die bijvoorbeeld zowel spelletjes gingen doen online, als uh, uh, misschien uh, wat vaker naar hun moeder belden uh, en uh, uh, buiten gingen wandelen en die veel verschillende dingen deden, dat dat beter werkte dan mensen die heel erg op één ding uh, uh, leken te focussen. Um, en wat belangrijk is, is praten over. Uh, het is een onderwerp waar veel mensen zich voor schamen, maar... Um, ja, het is goed om daar wel over naar buiten te treden, bijvoorbeeld bij een studentenpsycholoog of bij een huisarts als het dan wat langer speelt. Um, en ga echt proberen om uh, ja, dat actief aan te pakken, actief te werken aan die sociale spier die je in beweging moet houden. En actief uh, bezig te zijn om je relaties te onderhouden. Want hoe actiever je dat doet, uh, ja, hoe, hoe kleiner de kans dat er langdurige problemen door uh, ontstaan. Ja. Nou, daar sluit ik me eigenlijk uh, bij aan. Ik denk ja. hetgene wat ik daarover kan zeggen... Um, ja, is ongeveer uh, he, vergelijkbaar dat het, um, het wisselt per student wat de behoefte is. En uh, wat wij als studentenpsychologen doen is inderdaad samen met een student het gesprek aangaan en kijken van uh, ten eerste kijken welke mogelijkheden zijn er. Um, en wat daarvan past bij jou. Hè? Want je, je kan natuurlijk uh, lid worden van een studievereniging. Maar sommige studenten, uh, ja, daar, daar is dat te grootschalig ja. bijvoorbeeld voor. Of te, kost het te veel tijd. Terwijl ze ook het heel belangrijk vinden om genoeg tijd over te houden om te studeren. Hè? Dus dan bespreken we bijvoorbeeld... Goh, He, ook al wil jij optimaal uh, uh, studeren, je hebt toch tijd nodig uh, voor pauze. Dus misschien kan een kopje koffie met iemand drinken, een uurtje, he, een mooie combinatie zijn van eventjes pauze nemen ja. en uh, toch ook uh, een contact hebben. Dus daarin gaan we echt op zoek uh, ja, naar een passende vorm voor de persoon. Ja. Uh, een belangrijk uh, advies, denk ik, voor studenten die zich eenzaam voelen, is praat erover. Ja. He, want dat is eigenlijk de eerste stap. Degene met wie het bespreekt zal niet 1, 2, 3 de oplossing voor jou hebben. Um, maar het, het helpt al om te delen. En um, samen kun je daar wel over nadenken van welke ja. mogelijkheden zijn er, wat past bij mij. En ook heel belangrijk is eigenlijk om daarin de lat niet te hoog te leggen, je verwachtingen niet te hoog te leggen. Um, want ja, het gebeurt natuurlijk ook heel vaak dat jij een contact initieert... En dat het eigenlijk uh, op niks uitloopt. Dus dat is ook heel normaal. Ja, hè? ja zeker. Ja. Ja, en ik vind het ook nog wel belangrijk om te zeggen dat los van corona... Hè, ook voor corona waren er echt als studenten met ernstige eenzaamheidsproblemen. En um, voor mensen die eigenlijk van zichzelf ook weten van... ja, dit is niet iets van het afgelopen jaar sinds ik ben gaan studeren... maar misschien was het op de middelbare school ook al wel. En dit is gewoon wel een probleem dat ook bij mij hoort. Ja, dan is er misschien ook gewoon meer nodig. En dan is ja. advies als van, oh, ga gewoon bij een vereniging of zo. Dat werkt dan niet, want dan zijn er echt dingen die dat... ...in de weg zit. Hè? Bijvoorbeeld wat we heel vaak zien bij mensen die chronisch eenzaam zijn... ...dus die echt langdurig eenzaam zijn... ...is dat negatieve gedachtenpatronen ja. dat heel erg in stand houden. En dan is ja, dat echt serieus nemen en daaraan werken is wel belangrijk. En wat goed is om te weten dan misschien is... ...uit onderzoek blijkt wel dat het ook werkt. Dus dat het aanpakken van eenzaamheid kan. Het is niet een verloren zaak als dat nou eenmaal iets is wat jij al langer hebt. Ja. Uh, dat ja. is echt iets waar je... Uh, ja, ook in vooruit kan gaan. Dus dat is misschien goed om te weten. Ja. ja.